Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ventures. You know, normally in this show, we talk about the process of venture building and venture investing. And I wanted to actually take a moment to go back and, and share a clip from episode 11 with Dave Feldman, because heart disease is the number one killer in the world. You know, in the entrepreneurship landscape, we talk about solving problems, solving problems that are pressing. And so heart disease is right up on the top of the list. And I definitely want those, anybody who's listening or watching to be familiar with just kind of the basics of what causes heart disease. So we're gonna start by pulling out this clip where Dave talks about just kind of an introduction to lipidology. And we talk about what are lipids, why are they important to, to heart disease? And so you can listen to the, the full episode by going back to episode 11, but uh, I'm excited to share this clip with you that hopefully will be educational. I'll just I'll try to keep it to about 10 minutes or so. So if you're listening, you can also watch by visiting wclittle.com and there you'll see uh, some show notes based on this clip that I'll, that I'll share there. And if you're watching, you can also listen anywhere that you get your podcasts. You can just search for Ventures. So with that, please enjoy this clip from episode 11 with Dave Feldman. So from an education standpoint, my, my understanding is that all things lipidology essentially come down to there are certain molecules like cholesterol, certain fat soluble vitamins, different minerals, lipids themselves that need to be transported around the body in order to deliver fuel and vitamins, et cetera, et cetera. And these come, these, these lipoproteins is what they're called, come in lots of different shapes and sizes. Do you want to just maybe talk a little bit about the landscape of of, of lipidology a little bit to educate the, the audience? Yeah, so it's really pretty simple once you understand the basics. And the basics are this. If you've got something like sugar, sugar can be broken into glucose, and glucose can just be placed right into the bloodstream by your body. The reason is because it's soluble. And you can test this at home right now. You can put sugar into your coffee, into water, and you'll find it just distributes out because chemically it's soluble, it mixes well with water. It's what you would call hydrophilic, as in hydro water philic loving. And so boom, it, it hugs those water molecules, it and it therefore it can it can move with the water, just like in your bloodstream, it can move with your blood. Lipids, however, are hydrophobic, which is to say that they're uh, water fearing or water avoiding. And just like right now, if you try to take some butter, put that into your coffee. Uh, oh, of course, with coffee, it's a little bit of a different story because you've got other factors. But try, try mixing butter with uh, water, like room temperature water, or oil with water. You already know what's going to happen. They clump together. They seem to avoid the water and so forth. Well, this is a bit of a problem because your body actually needs these lipids, not just fat for fuel, but uh, as you were alluding to, there are fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K. They're all lipids. They don't mix well in the bloodstream. So the genius of your body is it makes something to carry them in the bloodstream that is water-soluble. And there's really two main things. They're, they're both proteins. One is something called albumin, which we probably won't talk about a lot, but that's that picks up the free lipids that are in the bloodstream. So if your fat cells release some fat into the bloodstream, albumin is a prominent protein that's like a life raft. It'll connect to that life raft and then it can get moved around in it. But the one we're especially interested in are called lipoproteins, lipid carrying proteins. And they're really kind of like a boat. You know, if if albumin was the life raft. Lipoproteins is like a is like a giant tanker. <laughs> and again, the genius of the body is it doesn't just pick and choose different tankers for each kind of lipid. It puts them all into these lipoproteins. So if right now you have a fatty meal and it included the following, it included triglycerides, which are fat-based fuel, and included fat-soluble vitamins, and it included cholesterol, your body will make a boat in your gut called the chylomicron, it's a lipoprotein, and put them all in that boat, really lots of boats, and can put it right into your bloodstream and it'll move just like the glucose does because it's water-soluble. And 
Then I won't get into it too much, but cells, the cells that need the stuff that's in those boats, they have a process through something called receptors where they can, they can kind of dock those boats and take things that they need off of it. It gets a bit complicated there, but where this becomes relevant to me is that I hypothesized early on based on a few tests that I did that if you're on a low carb diet and you're powered by fat, then this should make a difference as to why your LDL cholesterol is higher because LDL stands for low density lipoprotein. And cholesterol is riding in that same lipoprotein boat that your fat-based fuel is riding in. They're, they're ride sharing. It's like Uber, right? <laughs> and so if my body is making use of these boats to supply my tissues with this fat-based energy, it makes a lot of sense as to why my cholesterol levels would get impacted because they're in the same boats. Hmm. Yeah. That's right. So you get your test back. You're, it was a, I'm assuming a standard lip, lipid panel. So you got your yes. HDLC, your LDLC, Triggs. Do you want to talk a little bit about even just what, what is a basic lipid panel and when, what, what, what does that, what does that yeah. mean? Yeah. You basically summarized it. It's really four numbers. It's total cholesterol, which is just it's basically all the cholesterol found in lipoproteins for a given unit of blood. There's LDL cholesterol, which for a mnemonic, lots of people will say the L stands for lousy because it's the so-called bad cholesterol. There's HDL cholesterol, which the mnemonic is H for happy. As in, if your HDL cholesterol is high, it's usually a good thing. And then lastly, there's triglycerides. Triglycerides is literally the fat itself. It's a measurement of fat for a given unit of blood. Now, we, you and I, we've seen our LDL cholesterol climb going on a low carb, high fat diet. And that was one of the first things I wanted to check into. Why is that? Why would that happen? And even just from having the basic lipid panel, I was able to find that indeed, as I actually brought down the amount of calories I ate, and that includes saturated fat, that Surprisingly, my cholesterol levels went up, not down. You'd think that they would go down because I'm eating less saturated fat. I'm eating less food overall. But no, they went up. And then conversely, if I ate a lot of fat, a lot of saturated fat, I would find that my cholesterol levels went down. My total and my LDL cholesterol levels would go down from overeating a lot of fat. And what it turns out to be, and I'm just going to get a tiny bit complicated here, but hopefully everyone's following me thus far, is there's really two places where these boats are made. One is in the gut, your intestine, from food you just ate. Those are the chylomicrons I just mentioned. But just think of them as your, your gut boats, right? Mm -hmm. The other is in the liver, and those are VLDLs, very low-density lipoproteins. There's really just those two places where the boats are made. And why this is important is because the chylomicrons coming from your gut, they drop off their fat-based energy and they're very quickly absorbed by the liver. So they don't hang out for very long. But conversely, the boats that are made by your liver, the VLDLs, when they drop off their fat-based energy, about half of them remain in a very famous lipoprotein, the low-density lipoprotein. So they remodel from a VLDL to an LDL. And therefore, that cargo of cholesterol that's in the LDL gets detected and then raises alarm bells. People go, oh, well, there's more LDL in this case. Well, this is what makes sense, that inversion pattern I was talking about. It's inverted from how much I'm eating. If I'm eating a lot of fat, then that's a lot of chylomicrons coming in. My body wisely says, oh, well, we already have a lot of chylomicrons coming in that's carrying fat-based energy. Therefore, we don't need to have as much coming from the liver from storage. But conversely, if I'm, if I'm fasting or if I'm eating less and less fat, well, then guess what? My body starts to release more fat from my fat cells, and my liver packages a lot of those uh, fatty acids into uh, triglycerides, puts them on board these VLDLs, 
and, there, and drops off in remodels to LDLs, therefore leading there being more LDL. And that's why there's now a lot of people who've done this version of my experiment, uh, which colloquially is called the Feldman protocol, where coming up to a blood test, they'll test this by actually over consuming a lot of fat, actually eating a huge amount of fat for three days. And their LDL cholesterol will tend to plummet. It's about an 85% success rate, roughly. And so from an engineering perspective, first of all, I love approaching uh, biology and biochemistry from, a, from an engineering and systems perspective. Um, what, what, what would be the purpose of having the, the LDL stick around for a while, right? The VLDLs deliver the cargo. Are the LDLs still delivering cargo or, or kind of what's, what's up with the actual life of an LDL once it's been remodeled from a VLDL? Well, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because this was one of the frustrating things that for the longest time I had the same impression everybody else did, which is that LDL is, as some would even call it in the literature, a waste product. What's the value of having LDL that sticks around two to four days in your bloodstream if it serves no purpose? As it turns out, it actually serves many purposes. Uh, for one, it's a very integral part of the immune response. So let me give you an example. One of the fat soluble vitamins I mentioned is vitamin E, which is also known as alpha tocopherol. There's actually a few different flavors of it, if you will, that are all uh, uh, tyrols and trienols. But alpha tocopherol is the most common one. Now, the way it works is imagine this, this spherical boat that's the lipoprotein. Uh, alpha tocopherol actually protrudes the monolayer, it sticks out to the hull side of the boat. And it's a, it's, a, a, um, it's an antioxidant, but as you learn about these things, you find out antioxidants are kind of in their own way, just controlled pro-oxidants. Mm. When it comes into contact with another reactive oxygen species, such as a free radical, then it turns both it and the free radical into a non-reactive product. So it's like they disarm. That's why they're called antioxidants, is they can, they can help disarm oxidants. Now, why do they have this antioxidant on board? Well, it's been speculated for a long time. It's to protect itself. The LDL particles protect their cargo and protect themselves from becoming oxidized by having alpha tocopherol on board. But it's the, one of the most active pools of alpha tocopherol in the bloodstream. And absent, absent that alpha tocopherol in the bloodstream, the free radical isn't gonna go anywhere. So it can, because this is how free radicals work, it can come into contact with anything. And with its unpaired electron, it can ultimately pull an electron uh, from whatever surface it's in, such as like a cell, um, such as a cell wall, like the bilayer of a cell wall, and cause something known as a chain oxidative event. So what happens is it'll steal uh, an electron and that'll turn that molecule into a free radical, which will then in turn steal another electron until it terminates. It has to terminate at something that's going to accomplish evening the playing field, if you will, right? Yeah. Well, which would I rather have happen? Would I rather my LDL particle come into contact with that free radical first or that free radical come into contact with the cell wall and possibly cause a chain oxidative? Well, of course, I would rather come into contact with the LDL particle. And because it's constantly described as though it's its own defense, it disregards the fact that there's so many LDL particles already in the bloodstream that provide that constant state of contact. And that's why I think, but it's, it's hypothetical, I think that this could be part of the story as to why it is very low levels of LDL often correlate with higher levels of cancer in many cases. That doesn't mean that there can't be also uh, some cancers that can result in lower LDL, but they have observed this, particularly in uh, other ways in which you compromise the immune response you find that people have greater susceptibility to cancer. Let me give you just a quick example. Let's say you get um, uh, an organ transplant. Part of the protocol for getting an organ transplant is you're, off, you're often on immune suppressants, and this is so that you can receive this organ so that your own immune response won't reject it as easily. But those same people are more susceptible to getting cancer. 
uh, this, this appears to be in response to having to take immune suppressants. Well, so to what degree LDL particles are part of the immune response is important. I've only mentioned the antioxidants, but there are many other ways. For example, they bind to pathogens. Uh, they can also remove something called quorum sensing that bacteria use. And so there's many different ways in which they can uh, impact in a positive way toward the immune response that doesn't typically get a lot of attention. Let me just fit in one more thing. One of my favorite studies is, I believe they did this with uh, mice. I may have to find it, but it was with lipopolysaccharides, if I'm not mistaken. And they took a group of normal lipid level mice, as in they were just at normal lipid levels. And then they took some that were hyperlipidemic. They had hypercholesterolemia. They were called knockout mice, where they actually knock out the receptor that takes down the LDL particles. And they injected both with equal amounts of lipopolysaccharide, which is, um, for intents and purposes, something that's, that's going to need a good immune response to deal with. And the control group, 5% of them survived. Hmm. And the knockout mice, the ones that were hyperlipidemic, 100% of them survived, all of them, wow. every wow. single one. And again, mouse study, you know, take it with a grain of salt, but yeah. this yeah. is just one of those areas in which LDL particles are very relevant. Another one, just to fit it in real quick, I know I'm fitting in a lot of one statement, but another one, because I just get excited about this, is, uh, is your peripheral tissues can also endocytose. LDL particles, that is to say, engulf them. They, they have receptors that mediate the pulling them into the cell. And that's good because the cell's walls, that bilayer, is made of phospholipids and free cholesterol, which, by the way, is what these lipoproteins are made of. They're made also of phospholipids and free cholesterol. And I believe this is why you can see a drop in LDL particles common for people who are like heavy bodybuilders because I believe their muscle tissue for growth and repair are doing a greater amount of endocytosing of LDL particles for that very purpose. All right, a couple quick things before you go. Number one, I have a general newsletter where I write about technology and startups, and health science, and teaching people to code. And I write about a variety of different subjects that we talk about on this show. So if you go to wclittle.com, there you'll be able to subscribe and you'll also be able to subscribe to particular topics. If you're just interested in one or a few of them, you'll be notified right when I publish new content in those areas. Number two, my partners and I at Proto Ventures have a portfolio company called Startup Rocket. If you go to startuprocket.com, there you'll be able to receive coaching guides and customize an operations framework for you and your team and your advisors to be on the same page in terms of what is the appropriate next step for you and your entrepreneurial journey. And finally, if you wouldn't mind leaving a review anywhere that you have listened to this podcast or watched this podcast, it would be super helpful to help those who might be interested in consuming this content as well. Thank you.